Lee Davidson, sales, service, and all the accessories that you need for a great ride. The retail store has gift ideas for the Harley Davidson rider on your list, from t shirts to jackets, shot glasses to pint glasses, ride jackets and gloves. Stop in at Eisenhower's Old Route 15 south of Mansfield. They're proud to sponsor Saturday with Seniors on KC 101. Uh, I'm Gabe, and I'm here with my friend Thomas Putnam. How are you today, Thomas? I'm well. Thanks, Gabe. It's great. So, Thomas, I know you pretty well. I know that you've been in Tyler County for a long time. Your family has deep roots in the area. Uh, why don't we start with that? Tell us about your family and you know how long they've been in this area. My mother was a Webster, and the Websters have been around for a long time, as have the Hamiltons, which is another branch of that side of the family. So my grandfather was Dr. Jess Webster, who grew up along Marsh Creek on Webster Road, and he had a couple of brothers, and they were celery farmers in that whole muck area that went up toward Middlebury Center. But he decided that he wanted to be a doctor, and so traveled to Philadelphia and went to school there. And then he came back and worked at a hospital in Williamsport. But 1918 came and the flu epidemic came and they asked him if he would come back up here and help treat all the people who were suffering from the flu. And so he did. And uh, that's how he got back up here. But his roots go back very far. So he was a doctor here. He helped organize the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hospital. And his son, my uncle Lane, was also a doctor. I could talk all day about stories that my grandfather had about delivering babies in snow storms over the phone, um, you know, <laughs> helping a husband get through a pregnancy a birth. But then my on my grandmother's side, Alma Hamilton, Hamiltons were big in lumber industry, and he was a foreman of uh, lumber camps down near Tyadotton and Letonia and Blackwell and so forth. So those two families have been around Tyler County for a very long time. When you mentioned Tyadotton, of course, the, the village of Tyadotton technically doesn't exist. Not anymore. much there anymore, right? right. There are still a few houses. There oh yeah, as yeah, it remain, right? and the, yeah, there's some houses and there's some foundations kind of around, but right, not much there. But that grandfather, he had camps all over the place, and we can still see some of those camps. Actually, my grandmother was born in what is now the Burning Barrel down in Ansonia, because that was at one point kind of a boarding house, and her mother lived there, Susan Hamilton, and that's where my grandmother was born, right in that. So every time I go into the Burning Barrel, I, I think that. <laughs> My grandmother's born right upstairs. Wow, so. wow. Yeah. Now, I know you weren't born here. You're, you're originally from Michigan. Michigan, right. Yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So when my mother went to school at Mansfield, which was then Teachers College uh, in music, so she knew Stedman and all of the people whose buildings are named after. <laughs> and she did her master's degree in New York. And my father, who is from Kansas, also was studying music at Columbia that summer. And they met in a music class. And and their first date was walking across the George Washington Bridge, and they got married a year later. And promptly, Dad went into the Army, and it was in 1942. Then after the war, he was looking for a teaching position and sent out applications all over the place and got a job in Pontiac, Michigan. So they moved there in 46. And so my mom and dad both were teachers, music teachers. And since they were teachers, they had summers off. So every summer, as soon as school was out, we packed up our old blue station wagon with the paneling on the side. You know, that yep, wood yep. stuff on the side. I used to drive one and, like that. <laughs> and uh, and came here. Mm -hmm. My grandfather had built a cottage out near Ansonia. And so every summer of my life, my childhood, was spent right out at that cottage. Right. And that's the one that's called The Pines? Is that... Uh, cottage in the Pines. Cottage in the right. Pines, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. It's beautiful. Tucked up a little bit off of Route off 6. Off of Route 6. Right. right. And your grandfather built that. Is that correct? He did. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful place right on a nice uh, pond. Right. He yep. built the yep. pond, too. Yeah. So, <laughs> so coming here as a child from Pontiac. Now, I, I'm not familiar with Pontiac. I don't know if it's a big town or a small city or what it is, but what did it feel like going from where your home was to Grandpa's cabin in the woods? Well, just to give you a little perspective, Pontiac is about 85,000. Uh, that's where the Silver Dome was. Okay. And a huge automotive spot. Flint and Pontiac were the two big cities that had a lot of automotive plants. 
And I went to a school, my graduating class was 685. Wow. And multiracial. And so coming from there, I mean, I loved school, so I, I loved there. But coming to Pennsylvania was probably the most idyllic childhood anybody could imagine. Mm-hmm. Because my grandparents were here. All of my cousins were here, uh, at least on my mother's side, all the Webster cousins. So we spent lots of time up at the farm. Jerry Webster was another uncle, and Tim was a cousin. A lot of people know that side of the family. So during the summer, we were right there at the cottage. People would come to us. We had friends who would come and visit, and we only came into town that I can recall for church on Sunday mornings and occasionally a Thursday night movie which was the night that my grandfather came back into town for office hours. He had office hours. His office was above Dunham's store, and he would come in for office hours, so we'd get a ride back in to watch the movies watch at the, movie at the Arcadia. Yeah. It was a wonderful time. And uh, As some, a city boy, what was your favorite thing to do in the country? Swim, I think. Mm-hmm. We were out at the pond a lot. We'd go up to the farm a lot and ride horses up there. I just saw on Facebook the other day that Kathy Janeski, who was a cousin, posted a thing about my uncle used to have huge trail rides just outside of town up near his farm. And like 80 people would bring their horses. On a Friday, we'd have this huge chicken barbecue. And then all day Saturday, we'd ride all over the canyon and up and down and everywhere. It was quite an event. With all your family, cousins you only saw in the summertime, that must have been really a lot of fun for you. It was. We did not see cousins during the year. Occasionally we'd come for Christmas or Thanksgiving, but normally my grandparents would come out there for Thanksgiving. So it was primarily during the summers. Sometimes we'd leave the day after school was out in June and not go back to Michigan until the day before school started. Nice. uh, Yeah, Yeah, it was great. So uh, let's fast forward a little bit then, because obviously you grew up in Michigan. What brought you back to your roots. After high school, I went to college for a year and then wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And so then I did a number of things for a few years and traveled around and lived in a commune in Southeast Ohio and wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with my life. And my grandmother sent me a message and said, just come back, get a teaching degree at Mansfield. So I did. There, there you go. <laughs> we did what grandma said. That's right. Well, you know, that was past she took, so I guess... Uh, yeah, she was amazing. Mm-hmm. I mean, she was only about five feet one, and she loved flowers. She loved teaching. She loved cooking. She loved her family. She loved music. She was a painter. She was a, an amazing person. So, yeah, we all liked her. Yeah, sounds like it. So you came to Mansfield. So I came to Mansfield and got a teaching degree. And in, what year was that you got your degree? 76. Okay. And then taught here and there, Mansfield and here. And then in 79, I was a part of the New Covenant Academy starting. So I taught- launching that school, Brand new, that's right. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I was there solidly for 15 years or so. And then just part-time because I went back to school to get a master's degree and I started to work on a doctorate at Penn State. So I was just- kind of taught there part-time during those years. Okay. And then it was all education related, your degrees? Uh, English English. was a master's and working on the doctorate. So um, yeah, I didn't know quite what I was going to do with that, but I love to teach and I loved English. I love literature. So I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it, but that's what I did. So when you were a teacher and yep. particularly you know creating a new school, I would imagine education's a bit different these days than it was back then or even compared to what you experienced when you were a child yourself? I had an incredible childhood education. Our principal was amazing. I mean, it was different than anybody's, I think, because it okay. was pretty progressive. When I was teaching early years, I liked it. One of the reasons that I decided to leave it was because of all of the paperwork and regulations, and it just seemed to take away from what I really love to do, which was just interact with the people and work with the kids. I don't know. I I think it was a lot more personal at that point than it is now. But I see my grandkids and I really appreciate the teachers that they're having. So I don't know how much different it would be. Sure. Well, you know, circumstances are circumstances. I think the unifying idea for most of the teachers I know is what you're talking about. They have a passion for the subject and a love of teaching and educating, particularly kids and the relationships you've established in doing that. Yeah. The rest is just what you got to do to get through your day, right? Right. Right. So, well, you know, I kind of know where this story 
story goes from here, but I'm going to let you tell it. At some point, you had a little idea that became an enormous idea. Let's talk about Hamilton Gibson. Before it was Hamilton Gibson, it was just Thomas Putnam saying, hey, maybe we could put on a play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd always been interested in theater. I remember the first big play that I had ever seen, which was in Detroit, Touring Company of the Sound of Music. And uh, Florence Henderson was playing Maria. And I just remember saying that I just wished that uh, at the end that it wasn't over, you know, that I, I was so caught up with it. So I was involved with theater in high school. And that first year of school that I went to in Illinois was in theater. But then I kind of drifted away from that for a while. But while I was teaching at New Covenant, we produced plays there. And that's the first place that I directed The Miracle Worker and some other plays, Pride and Prejudice, and some other things. And Mansfield University used to have a summer theater, a tent outside what used to be Allen Hall. Right. And that was up all summer, and so there were great shows there. Wellsboro had a kind of a loose group, I forget now what it was called, but they would produce plays occasionally, but there really wasn't any opportunity for community people to participate in a play. This is more from the perspective of a show was put on and people would come to see it. Is that my understanding? Uh, that correct? No, no, yeah. people were, I mean, oh, okay. they could be in it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the one in Mansfield, the tent theater, they brought in people from New York. Kevin Klein was there before he got really famous, but then the community people also would participate. And this one that was here in town, Gaslight, Little Theater, they called it. Tommy Walrath was involved in it. So it was a community, but it was very loose and there was really no organization to it. But Wellsboro used to have, and I remember the Bates Auditorium, which was down on the corner where now First Citizens Bank is. Mm -hmm. And that was torn down and I think it was 58. But I remember that building right on the corner. It came right up to the sidewalk. And that used to be a huge draw for the community. And my uncle, he'd tell stories. They lived on Wall Street, you know, coming home from working and flying with his trombone down for a community band rehearsal or something like that. My mother sang in some of the musicals that they had there. So there's a lot in Wellsboro that historically that offered those opportunities. But at that point in the late 80s, there really wasn't any opportunity. So in the summer of 91, just a handful of people got together and said, let's put on some sort of a show. And we did. <laughs> uh, we used the what is now a little church building. It used to be before that, a farm implement garage right there by the junction of 660 and Route 6, halfway between Wellsboro and Mansfield. And the back room was this big garage full of grease and oil and all sorts of automotive parts. And we got permission to clean that all out and power washed it and borrowed some chairs from the Chamber of Commerce and bought some well-used lights and we put on a show. <laughs> and so, obviously, an enormous learning curve. I mean, you just had some experience directing plays at school the kids, yeah. But you know, we're talking about the, the very infrastructure of theater here. Right. Yeah, it was fun. So and what was uh, the first play in that space? The Miracle Worker. It was the, mir <laughs> it was the Miracle Sticking Worker. Sticking with what you knew, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, we did it then, and then 10 years later, we did it again, and 10 years after that, we did it again. So right. I, yeah, there you uh, go. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was kind of a staple, but kind of a celebration of that first one. Right. So yeah, we started with that play, and then we did a musical version of The Yearling, uh, the novel a Yearling about the little boy with the deer. And we had no idea whether it would last or whether we should do it again. And we decided, yeah, I mean, people came to see it. So we did it some more the next summer in the same place. And how long were you in that space before you decided to form We did. We did a couple of plays the next summer right there. And we also did the musical. We did Oliver at the Wellsboro High School. I think we were only there one more year. And then that was it. Okay. And then we started in a number of different places. We went to Don Gill Elementary School and moved in there for the summer in the multi-purpose room. And now we've been a lot of different places. Right, yeah. So you touched on an interesting point, so I want to come back to that. You mentioned a uh, back auditorium? Beach. Beach. B -A -C -H -E. I always thought it was Bach because... <laughs> right. B-A-C-H-E with the E. Yeah, 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 yeah. Beach. And that was a focal point for the community. People would come to see shows. Yeah. We'd go to perform. It could be the band. It could be a play. Hamilton Gibson is a community theater. I'd like you to talk a little bit about, you know, what that means in the emphasis of community. You know, you started with a small group of people who just had this crazy idea. Let's put on a show. What transformed it into by the time I moved here was kind of like this cultural cornerstone in this area from the perspective of building a community around the idea of performance. 
We just finished Mary Poppins, and it's a fairly large cast. And it's always amazing to me at the end of every production to see the connections that people have made during the rehearsal process. I mean, it's usually six to eight or so weeks. And so these people are coming together. And in this case, there were people from all over. And very few of them actually knew each other. Some people knew no one. But by the end of those eight weeks, because they've spent so much time together working on something together, something positive, something creative, there's a real connection there. And I'm not sure there are too many other opportunities or activities that can foster that kind of connection. And I think it's because they're all working on one creative goal. And uh, I mean, there's something about theater that allows us to crawl around in somebody else's skin. And I think that that in itself allows us to be open to other people and other ideas and tolerant of other people and so forth. So it's a, I mean, I know melting pot is kind of overused, but it allows people to be themselves and yet to be able to accept other people for who they are. So right. You're right. I mean, once somebody leaves school, where are your associations? At the place that you work, perhaps a place of worship, and that's in your immediate family. You know, uh, American life nowadays is kind of fragmented. Right. I go to work, I leave there I come home I'm with a different set of people Sunday mornings I go to church so where do we find our community what other opportunities are there right now tell us about becoming Hamilton Gibson so far in the early part of the story it was just people putting out or did you become Hamilton Gibson immediately the name the name and and then becoming an organization as yeah. opposed to just a bunch of people who did plays well that summer we did a lot of talking and a lot of fun I can remember we were starting from scratch and we didn't really know what we were doing. Yeah. But Rob Fitzgerald from Mansfield was involved in that summer hanging lights at midnight or into the night with Bonnie Raitt's song had just come out, let's give them something to talk about, <laughs> blasting that out. And so we thought, yeah, let's give them something to talk about. So anyway, we talked a lot about, are we going to continue with this or how can we continue with this? And should we have a name rather than just Wellsboro's Community Theater or Tioga County's Community Theater? And so we really wanted it to be multi-generational and we did that with the first play because the little girl that played Helen Keller was I think in second grade and in fact there was somebody who was in Mary Poppins this summer who was five years old when she was one of the blind girls wow. in the miracle worker and her mother was one of the main characters in that so that was really cool so we wanted to be multi-generational and we wanted it to be inclusive of everybody anybody who wanted to participate so we toyed with a whole a lot of different names and you know I'm not sure whether we had the name by the end of that summer or whether it was the next year when we decided that we'd actually do something else the next summer but my two grandmothers as I already mentioned one of them Alma Hamilton Webster was so instrumental in my life and was so generous with sharing what she knew. She was a teacher and she loved art and beauty. And my other grandmother, my dad's mother, was also an educator and loved music and art. And she used to give what she called expression lessons. They had to stand up and read a poem or something, but with lots of expression. And there was certain, it was very stylized kind of thing. So we just thought those two names kind of sounded cool. Her name was Louise. Gibson. So we put those two together. I wanted it to be called Aaron's Beard, but I got overruled. So <laughs> I said, oh, we don't want this just about my two grandmothers. And it really wasn't. The discussion was just the feel of intergenerational and a love of kids and a love of the arts and music and so forth. So I wanted it to be Aaron's Beard because the old poem from centuries ago that said that when people dwell together in unity, it's like the oil that comes down on Aaron's beard. And that's what I wanted was a place where people could dwell together in unity and all their differences put aside, come together for one common goal and experience. But we yeah. didn't want that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've got Hamilton Gibson. There you go. Obviously, listeners know that I'm a Hamilton Gibson volunteer, been involved with it for quite a while. And when theater folks get together, they tell stories. You talk about being inclusive. Everybody's welcome. But surely, Thomas, not everybody's as good an actor as others. As a director, I mean, you're trying to put on a good show but you're also trying to include everybody. How do you strike that balance? Probably most of the people who participate have not been in a play. They might have been in something in their high school, but not as an adult. So I think that providing a safe place is 
kind of the bottom line. Being up on stage is really allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. Pretty and, terrifying, uh, right? That's yeah. why they call it stage fright. Everybody watching us, everybody focused on us, everybody listening to us. But I think by creating a safe place, safe in all ways, that people have the opportunity to really explore and to let down their guard and to realize if they fall, we'll catch them. We're there to, to support. And I think without fail over the last 32 years, we've been able to do that. And there are people who say, where do you find all this talent? And where do these people come from? And so far, I say, well, the people who live next door to you or back on the back road or wherever, people who just want to step out of their comfort zone a little bit or try something new. We've had all different kinds of reasons why people have come, which is really exciting. But I think that's the basis. The director doesn't want them to fall on their faces and isn't going to let them. And so if they can just trust the directors and trust their fellow actors, then they're free to be able to really explore the character and crawl around in their skin for a while and come up with something meaningful. Acting is a lot more than just memorizing words and knowing where to oh, walk geez, yeah. on stage. You right. know, you're describing something that's a lot more exploration. Right. Have you oh, ever yeah. had anybody go, I'm scared of doing this, I need to stop? I think some people have said that, but we've convinced them to stay. <laughs> Were they glad that you convinced them? Oh, yeah. If they can get past that. You know, they're sometimes in the middle of a production. I think, what in the world have I gotten myself into? This is just hard work, for one thing, but it's a lot of energy. But I think, as I said, that with the support of everybody else and the goal in mind, people stick with it. I think they're very glad. I may be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be people that I've forgotten about. Who have just said, <laughs> people have had to drop out for other reasons, you know, but people certainly have said that. Over the years, I see a lot of people come, they do a few shows, then they kind of take a step back, you don't see them for a while, and then they come back again. Mm -hmm. So it seems to become kind of habit forming, or at least for some of the folks. We had one fellow who came and he was a recovering drug addict, and it was part of his recovery time. And he came and just wanted to give back somehow. And so he came and he was only in one play, and he was great, and he loved it. You know, at that point in his life, that's what he needed. And we've had a lot of people who have come for a variety of reasons. One time when we were auditioning for a play and there were about 12 women, no men there. And I said, why are you here? So they just went around the table and everyone just about had a different reason for why they had come to that audition. It was then that I said, you know, we've got to have more opportunities for women. That's what started the Hamilton Gibson's Women's Project. Because you had more women than you had parts we had, for. We had more women than we had parts for, but they were all really really wonderful reasons, you know, like one person had just retired and they were looking for something to fill their time. Another person was going through a really rough divorce and wanted something to focus on and others had just always wanted to do it, but just never had the time to do it. So that's what started that. I like this idea that you're looking to create opportunities. And so part of Hamlet Gibson's mission and your mission has been to find out who isn't getting opportunities. Right. And tell me about the starting of the youth choirs, because that was a big part of Hamilton Gibson. In 1993, we did a play. Uh, in fact, that was the first play that we did that was not in the summertime. I'd come across a little play called I Never Saw Another Butterfly. It was the story of children in Terezy in Czechoslovakia. And so we found poems that were written by these children who had gone through this concentration camp. While they were there, they wrote poems and produced a newspaper, painted or sketched with any material they could. So it was children who were finding their humanity through the arts. So we incorporated some of those musical selections into this little play. We had over 100 kids audition, ended up with about 72 or 75 kids who were on stage singing this incredibly difficult music with a subject matter that was pretty challenging for kids. Kay Galloway was the accompanist, and she and I, after it was all over, said, you know, this many kids are hungry for some really challenging music and an opportunity to delve into things like this. So it was just a few years later, 96, is when we started the Children's Choir for grades four through eight. It's been wonderful. We've traveled all over the place. In fact, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. was just opening up then, and we took the Children's Choir there. And then a few years later, we went to 
Prague and traveled up to Terezin. So that was an incredible experience. Yeah. When communities talk about what's important, music programs, theater programs, literature programs are the kind of things that people say, well, that's, that's nice to have. What's important, of course, are these things. But what is your answer to why is this valuable? The arts? Yeah. <laughs> Particularly performing arts. Yeah. The arts are what make us human, I think. It's an expression. It's a way to be vulnerable and yet really discover who we are deep down and take chances and connect with other people. And in that process, building more community, which is also a very good thing. Oh, yeah. I think especially since COVID, we realize more and more the need for community and connection. And so that's what we're all about. Well, Thomas, thank you for being our guest this Saturday. We appreciate you coming through. Uh, always excited to hear and see the things that Hamilton Gibson are doing. Can't wait to hear what your plans are for 2024. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Gabe. You've been listening to Saturday with Seniors, brought to you by Eisenhower's Tioga County Harley Davidson. If you're a veteran, thank you for your service. Stop into Eisenhower's and ask for your free Veterans Pass to the Tioga County Fair. If you missed any of the past episodes of Saturday with Seniors, just go to YouTube.com and find our channel. Or simply search Saturday with Seniors on YouTube to find the interview 